So I did want to touch on one other thing that's a difference between sort of traditional mortise and tenon joinery and loose tenon joinery, especially in the case of the domino. Now if we were to consider this like a traditional mortise and tenon tenon, so it's got four sides, correct? It's got four sides of long grain. So when this is inserted into a mortise that's basically sized for the tenon, it's able to glue on all four sides with a really strong joint. Now typically a mortise is always going to have two long grain sides and then two end grain sides. So if we were to look at the mortises that I have here for this domino mortise, when you look inside this hole, the sides of the wall, these two sides, those are long grain sides. But the bottom and then the top of that mortise, both, they have end grain coming up into them. So they're not going to be a very strong joint. Meanwhile, on the top one here, we have a little bit of a different orientation. Because it's going right into the end grain, it actually has all four sides on the inside of that mortise are long grain. So you could get up to four sides of really good, strong glue joint. So using a traditional tenon in you know, mortises, if they weren't these ones here, uh, in these different orientations, in one case, I would get two long grain to long grain surfaces. In the other case, I'd get four. So either way, it's going to be a strong joint. Now if we go and consider how things are with a domino. A domino has long grain surface here and a long grain surface here. These two sides here, I don't really call it, they are long grain but they're not really making good solid contact to the outside edges of the mortise. Now, if you put glue in there, you're going to see that glue squeezes out along these grooves. Now, granted, it's going to swell a little bit and press, but it's still not going to be pressing really hard and making a really strong joint. And certainly, if you were to look at the amount of contact surface on those sides, they're probably about half at best. So that means the orientation of the domino going in is going to make a difference. Now, for this side joint here, there's only two long grain surfaces, and when I stick this domino in, both of its long grain surfaces are touching, so this is a really strong joint. This is just as strong as a traditional mortise and tenon joint done the same way, with the same dimensions. However, when we look at the top, now when we insert this in here, well, there's two long grain sides on this domino that are really in play here, and both of those are touching a long grain side. But the other two long grain sides are really not participating too much in this. So you're only getting two sides that are gluing up instead of the four that you would be getting. But that's still not bad. You still have two long grain to long grain surfaces. It's just to say that, I guess technically speaking, you are losing two surfaces that you would be getting with a traditional mortise and tenon. So you do take a little bit of a hit for the efficiency of using a tool like this versus doing it the more traditional way. You would get a little bit of a stronger joint. Now if this is stronger than what you need, then it doesn't really matter. Now one of the cases where things get a little bit different is if you're trying to mortise into the side of the board here. Now if I put this this way here into the side of this board, the two long grain surfaces on this domino are going to be touching the two long grain sides inside that mortise. Again, it's going to be a very strong joint. But now if I rotate this domino this way here, the two long grain surfaces are going to be touching end grain inside that mortise. It's a considerably weaker joint. So there you might want to make sure that there's some structure to your project that's uh, reinforcing that or do some other type of reinforcement to it or even try doing the joint possibly not with as big of a domino but use two smaller ones rotated on their side so you can get the long grain in there. So again this just shows a little bit of the trade-off that you get. You get a, a huge jump in efficiency by using a domino. You can just make so many mortises so quickly and fast that are nice and flush but at the same time, there's some times where you have to maybe think about using it a little bit differently in certain situations simply because of the, the way that it works. So the next thing you want to look at are doing miters. So on a miter cut like this, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to put a domino going across the joint. Now, in this case here, you're going to end up having flat grain to flat grain on the inside of those mortises. So it's going to be a very strong joint. Now for positioning the domino, sometimes you see references to using the pins or the paddles to kind of hook a pin or a paddle on here so that you get it in a certain place. It's like, it's just so much easier to put the joint down, put the domino on the top so that you know it's going to be somewhere where it's not going to go too far. You know, you don't want to be up here and possibly expose it. You're going to want to be down, down in the meat of it all. And then just figure out where the center line is of that and just draw a line and then do both of them strictly by, by eye. Now part of the reason you don't want to hook anything on the edges like this is this is already a pretty fragile edge. It goes, it goes right down to, to nothingness there. So you want to make sure that that stays protected. Now when you're trying to join pieces that have bevel cuts involved, like you know, there's some compound angles in this project I'm currently working on, you'd have to be able to put a mortise into these beveled surfaces. Now in the case of this project here, actually it's got some really wacky angles. It's got eight unique compound angles that go around one side that are mirrored to the other. So 
uh, I think it's an interesting project, so take a look for my video, Angle Madness, and you'll, uh, you'll see me pulling my hair out on this thing. But for doing the joinery on that, I want to use dominoes to do the connection between the parts. This is just a mock-up. And the problem is, I need to be able to mortise into that little tiny surface on the side. And really, for doing this joinery, I can't plant this right in the middle, or else this domino is going to stick out the outside where it's not going to show. You know, I'm going to be using smaller ones. I'll be doing using dominoes that are for the 500, and they'll be much closer to the inside surface so that they won't stick out onto the other side. But that means that when I go to set the angle on this thing here, it's going to be really close to the center of this bit. So there's not going to be a lot of reference surface down here for me to be able to set that angle. Now, there is a protractor on the side here for setting angles, as well as there's some positive stops. And I checked the positive stops on this particular fence, and they were pretty much dead on. So I'm very happy with that. I haven't verified on the other fences, however. But what I find is useful is when you're dealing with some bevel angles that are maybe not the common ones that are on here, is take a block of MDF and then just run it through the table saw with the correct bevel. And you're going to use it as a way of setting this fence. So for that crazy project, actually, this is my, my bevel block. I have four unique bevels uh, that are all kind of wacky angles. Now, the way that I would set this is I'd first raise this up to get myself you know, a pretty good amount of meat down here that I can register against. And then after that, I'm going to tip the fence down. And now I'll put it up against my block on whichever angle. Let's just pick this one. So make sure it's pressing firmly where the bit is going to be coming out. You can look at it down here. It's actually easier to do on the table, but then you wouldn't be able to see. <laughs> and then keep going down until this thing here is just hiding all light. There we go. Now I've killed the light on that. So to me, that's set. Uh, what's actually kind of tricky about this is that these four bevel angles are all like 22.845, 22.532, 21.875. So these are all really close to the positive stop at 22 and a half on, on here. So you have to kind of fight that little bullet lash that wants to come out and give you a positive stop. But you can easily enough do that and then set it. This to me is the most accurate way of doing it. Because if you try to do this bevel cut, and you don't have it at the right angle so that it's going in dead square to this, this surface, if for some reason it's, it's too shallow or it's too steep, you're going to end up either getting some gapping on the inside or you're going to get some gapping on the outside. Now, personally, between the two, I'd much rather err on the side of getting some gapping on the inside because I can hide that. But then it would end up messing up all my compound angles, and I'm not going to let that happen. So another trick for dealing with these type of bevel angles like that, though, is go ahead and make yourself a block. I mean, it doesn't have to be this big. I did it this big. Uh, it could be just two layers of three-quarter MDF. I made it taller just mostly for this video, and I don't know, it looks kind of cool. Is that when you make the bevels and then you go to assemble it on a dry run, just push it in. And if it's not, if it's, if it's not killing all the light, if it's opening one way or another, that tenon is fighting you. That means that the bevel wasn't quite exact when you did the, the plunge. To me, the best option for that then is to say you were using eight millimeter dominoes, if you have the 500, maybe back off to the six. So you still have the eight hole, but you put a six in there and then you fill it with thickened epoxy. So the whole thing is gonna glue in there and it's got basically the tenon in there acting as a good joint between the two, but you're able to get the angle to be exact so these two are closed. That's always been the best solution for me. So another caveat when you're dealing with beveling on this fence, I mean, we're used to using it, you know, there, and there. But if you're using it on any of these angles, one of the things you might want to do is take a look at your fence right here, right where this fence comes down and meets with the vertical part of this face that where you're doing the plunge. Just watch where that intersection is. As you're tilting it up and you're tilting it down, you see where that intersection moves up and moves down. So that means if you're using this height adjustment here for the distance between what you perceive is where this fence is and where the bit is, it's actually incorrect. That's only correct when the fence is at 90 degrees. So you're gonna to want to, if you're making a measurement, to maybe go a little bit shallower on the depth. So if you're, you know, if you're supposed to be, I don't know, eight millimeters down from the reference surface, maybe go only six so that you're pulling it a little bit closer to that inside angle. And then do a test plunge on, on some scrap material to make sure that it is exactly where you're gonna want it. Now in continuing the discussion of dealing with some bevels, let's pretend that these aren't you know thin pieces. Pretend that this is a bevel cut that I made on a long panel that's actually you know, pretty darn thick. <laughs> so I'm going to be wanting to join these, say, at 45 degree angles. Now, normally you would just set the domino up, you'd set that fence up like that, and then you'd be plowing into the edge like that, and then you'd join this up on this side here. Now, in that case there, you're going to be placing the dominoes, again, 
picture this to being a, uh, these long pieces of stock that have a bevel cut on the edge. These dominoes, with the way that you're going to be placing the fence, are then going to go in like this. It's very much the exact same cut that you see in this picture. This is one of the promo pictures that they use for the XL. You can see that the guy has a very wide panel here, and then he mortised into the ends. Now if you take a look in that, this domino is going in into a hole where all the sides are all end grain. There's almost no long grain in there at all. So in a way, this is only going to be for alignment. There really isn't going to be that much strength, which is why he's plotted so many of those, is so that at least that weaker long grain to end grain joint, you know, size it a little bit and then put some really good glue in there. In quantity, those will hold that joint very stoutly. But there might be a better way of doing that. And with the additional plunge depth that you have with the XL, you might be able to make this joint a whole heck of a lot easier. Okay, so I got unlazy and got some panel type boards that we can try showing this off on. So the idea is this, and I think I'm gonna try this the next time I need to do a miter cut like this. So imagine these are being joined to 90 degrees, but this is being beveled at 45 and 45 so that you'll get a nice miter into this corner. So I mean, it looks a lot nicer on certain types of boxes. So another way of doing it then say beveling it first, changing the fence angle on the domino and plowing into the beveled side, which is kind of really a nuisance to be quite honest. What we could do instead is we could stand this up here because this is where the joint is going to go. We can just mark some pencil lines of where we want those dominoes to go. So now what we would do is a pretty normal cut that we're used to doing with the domino. We would have these pencil lines and we're going to try getting this mortise way near the bottom. So we're going to do this cut using the pencil line I just drew but we're going to be making those mortises much further down on this board. Then on this board here, where we have these pencil lines, now I'm going to flip the domino up, place it on there, line it up to those pencil marks, and plow straight down. Now the plunge depths are going to be such that you want it to be on the board that's being mortised on the flat, you want it to go pretty far down. I mean, you want to leave enough space on the end that you're not going to be blowing out, but you want it to be about that deep. And that's also the depth, the exact same depth that you use on this one. So now that you've made those mortises, now go run this through and put the bevel cut on it. So we're going to do a bevel cut. We're going to be cutting it here. And then on this board here, we're going to be cutting it here. Basically, the off cut that we're going to get is going to have you know, a bunch of mortises going through it, and we're going to throw that away. What's going to be left exposed is a beveled side like this with a mortise going straight down on the one, and, on the, on the, and then on the other one, it's going to be a mortise going straight up into the board. So then when you do the glue up, then you'd be putting them in vertically instead of on the bias. So that's something I'm going to try the next time I need to do a box like that using the XL, because the XL's plunge depth would work for that. You can do it with a 500 if your material is thinner, but the same technique should work just fine. So then you don't have to worry about the fence angle being exact, matching your bevel quite as much. What you're doing is you're setting it to the 90 degrees. It's going to be set to 90 degrees and it's going to make that bevel, if you screwed up the bevel, it's going to hold the bevel at 90 degrees, which is kind of what you would rather have anyway.